I see you're ready to begin Module 2, Research and Developmental Psychology. I'll share with you that the last time I taught this course was the first semester of COVID when we had to switch to Zoom and online learning. And I was re-prepping the course, uh, adding uh, narrations to the PowerPoint since that was a live course. Since then, your textbook has pulled this particular chapter, or rather module, out of Module 1 and made it a separate module which I think is a very good idea. The first module was huge before, so I'm glad to have a separate coverage. And they reduced some certain things that they were went a little bit overboard on before, so I think it's an improved coverage. Now, in terms of for you, though, you'll find that many of the concepts that you learn in Introduction to Psychology or uh, and or Introduction to Sociology will be found in this course, so it'll be some nice review, but you'll be also adding on new content, so I think it'll be a very nice blend of old and new for you. So I hope you found it useful, and if you go on to take uh, ex the Experimental Methods course, it will be very useful for you, too. I like to slip in review slides whenever possible to facilitate your learning process. So can you answer it? four goals of psychology and the two that are the focus of developmental psychology? Think for a moment. I think you do know them. So hopefully you're thinking describe or description, explain or explanation, though you could put understand or understanding if you prefer for the second one. Third one, predict or prediction. And fourth one could be a lot of things, control, change, help, modify, influence. And which two will we focus on? Well, the first one of describe or description and the second one of explain or explanation or understand or understanding. So hopefully that was easy peasy for you. Here's one other review slide from module one. Do you recognize these three gentlemen? Take a moment and see if you can. The name that is. On our left, we have G. Stanley Hall. He was born in the mid 1800s and died in the mid uh, 1920s if you're an exact date person uh, 1848 to 1924 uh, Jean Piaget Swiss researcher focusing on children's cognition as I'm sure you know uh, he was born just before 1900 and died in exactly the year 1980 and Paul uh, Balthes born in the mid-1930s and died fairly recently, as I mentioned before, in 2006. How do psychologists obtain their knowledge? Magazines, internet, secondhand sources. Hopefully you're not tempted by those answers. See if you can decide where we do get our knowledge, and then we'll see you on the next slide. We utilize the scientific method. You are likely to have come across the scientific method sometime in your past. We're going to divide it into four distinct steps. Your previous teacher might have had a pre-step. If you had a pre-step, that's fine. You can certainly keep it. So let's take a look at these steps of the scientific method. So the scientific method is used to generate, in other words, to make and test a specific hypothesis. But, but what is a hypothesis? It is a testable prediction, and it needs to be specific. So we can't say that, oh, this thing affects the other thing. That's too vague. How does it affect it? It gets slower, faster, stronger, weaker, sadder, happier, accurate, less accurate. Uh, you get the idea. So it's a very specific, testable prediction. So for our first step, we have developed a hypothesis. The asterisk means I'm going to have some cautions for you in the next slide based on common mistakes I see students make on tests. You cannot put the word hypothesis. It's a lazy answer. It's not a complete concept. 
So develop a hypothesis is a good answer, though you do not have to say develop a hypothesis for me. You could say, well, think of some different ways of saying develop a hypothesis, and I'll pause for a moment. Create a hypothesis, good. State a hypothesis, excellent. Formulate a hypothesis, you get the idea. So on the test, uh, definitely tell me a phrase involving a hypothesis. You also need to know this hypothesis needs to be a statement, not a question. You'll see that on the next slide. And also, it must be specific. It's not sufficient to say that one variable affects another. How does it affect it? It makes it quicker, slower, bigger, smaller, and so on. So again, it needs to be a specific prediction. For step two, you could put test hypothesis. That's a logical follow-up. Conversely, it's also very good to put gather data. Either one is good, but don't put both on a test. If you double list a step, it makes me think that you're confused. So choose one or the other, whichever you prefer. I've listed for you some of the different ways of testing the hypothesis. Observational research, case study, survey, correlational study, experiment. So we have many options, including these, and it is some additional ones as well. The next step, you'll create a mountain of data. The next step would be analyze the data. Do you have to use the word analyze? No, you could interpret it. You can apply statistics to it, but you get the idea. More than just one word. Last step, and a lot of students stop there, and unfortunately they can't get full credit. The last step is to publish the results. Can you share that differently? Absolutely. Share the results is also very good. So absolutely positively make sure that you can easily list the four steps of the scientific method. I'm sure by now the scientific method has crossed your path more than once in your life. And you might note that it varies slightly from class to class. The method does not vary, it's just the teacher's emphasis. So if you compare my steps listed here, four steps, you might compare them to the text and notes the textbook gives several more steps and divides them a little bit differently. Um, perhaps your previous teacher did. Some teachers include what I would call the pre-steps, such as reading research in the field, uh, generating a question. I certainly don't object to those steps, but in my mind, they're pre-steps. So we're going to go with this four steps streamlined. So hopefully it will complement how you learned it before. So on the previous slide, I mentioned these cautions. Again, one word answers will be marked long if it's discussing the scientific method. A hypothesis must be a statement, not a question. It must be specific. I often have students who say that one thing affects the other, and unfortunately they don't receive credit. You have to be specific. But here's a question for you. For step two, we said you do not have to put gather data or test hypothesis. What if a student puts do an experiment? Do you think they'll receive credit or not? Unfortunately, this student would be marked wrong, and very commonly on tests, oh, 25%, 30% of the class would get marked wrong on this particular step. Why is this not correct? It says do an experiment, which means you must do an experiment. But what if the person wants to do a correlational study, a survey method, and so on? So your answer must include all the possibilities. If you say gather data, that includes all the possibilities. If you say test your hypothesis, that includes all the possibilities. So your answer must be inclusive, so do an experiment only limits you to an experiment, so you would not receive a credit. So again, caution on your test. Here's our scientific method again, with a specific example and pictures for the visual people. The first step, he is developing a hypothesis, apparently the effects of sugar on activity levels. Second step, gathering data, apparently observation was chosen. Three analyze the results, and four, apparently he was able to publish in the Journal of Psychology. You'll notice that it introduces the term replication, which we'll discuss on our next slide. Now that I've snuck in that little public service announcement, let's return to our task of the scientific method. Look at these three students, student A, student B, student C. Look at each answer and 
see if you think that would be acceptable or not for a test. Let's look at student A first. Step one, great. Step two, big problem, too specific. It leaves out many research methods. Three, fair enough. Four, also good. For student B, number one, much too lazy. What about the hypothesis? That would not receive credit. Two, fine. Three, fine. Four, also fine. Student C, one is good. Two is vague enough. It's also good. Three is good. And four is good. So make sure that you, if asked this question on a test, would be able to do it easily. Let's see how well you're doing on this hypothesis topic. Read the slide and note these three examples. Are they all good hypotheses? None of them? Some of them? So identify the true hypothesis or hypotheses. Our first example has a question, not a statement, so that is not a hypothesis. I often see questions on tests. The next one is prediction, statement, specific. It is an excellent hypothesis, and we can test it. The third one, much too vague, so it would not be a good or testable hypothesis. It will not be sufficient for a course to just be able to create or recognize the steps of the scientific method. You'll also be able to need to create a hypothesis on your own and then apply the concepts learned when we discuss the experiment. So let's start here. Create a hypothesis about the content of this particular slide. So I'll go for a serious one that actually matches research but yours just has to fit the criteria of being a hypothesis. A serious one would be that people that are sleep deprived will consume higher amounts of junk food. It's specific and it's testable. Before we look at specific research methods, we should introduce ourselves to the ethical guidelines that we must follow when doing experiments. Let's start with IRB. This is an acronym that you absolutely positively should know. It stands for Institutional Review Board. And yet when I ask it on test, I get all sorts of different words for I, uh, international, internal, and so on. You know, every college and every research uh, facility has an IRB. SCCC has an IRB. I was actually 50% of it back in the day. Albany has an IRB. Siena has an IRB. St. Rose has an IRB. So think of the different colleges around us, including ourselves. Institutional Review Board. They must approve of psychological research before it's conducted. So they'll look at the proposal, maybe they'll ask it for it to be changed, maybe they'll think it's good as it is, or maybe they'll out and outright reject it. Now let's look at informed consent. It's got three components. One is we must tell you what we can about the experiment. It might not be a whole lot, but we must inform you about the details of the experiment. Second step, you must be told that you have the right to decline you have the right to refuse to participate. Rather like marriage in our culture, just because you're asked, you do not have to say yes. The third one, even in the middle experiment, you can change your mind, you can withdraw, which is also rather like marriage in our culture. So you must be informed about as much as we can about what will happen in the experiment. You must be told that you have the right to refuse to participate. And you must be told that you have the right to quit, to withdraw, even after the experiment has begun. If you agree to all that and sign your name on the dotted line, not only do we have your consent, but we have your informed consent. You were informed and then you consented. It's rather like medical informed consent. They tell you every possible bad thing that happened. You still want the surgery? Go ahead, sign on the dotted line. They too have your informed consent. Let's consider the topic of deception and debriefing. Can modern day psychology experiments use deception? Many of my students are quite surprised. Yes, indeed, deception is allowable. A placebo pill is deception. The control group uh, is deception. So yes, deception is allowed. You must convince the IRB that it's necessary. Now, if you deceive, you must follow that with debriefing. Debriefing means that you tell the people in the experiment the deception was used 
and why you thought to be necessary. So again, deception is permissible and debriefing must occur. Next one, confidentiality. If you know what that, means, that word means in any context, it's the same here. So we're not allowed to share uh, that you were in the experiment. We're not allowed to share what we found about you. You'll be subject A, subject 972 or so on. So it'd be like calling up your doctor and asking, is so-so a patient? Is so-so being treated for whatever condition? They are not allowed to say confidentiality. What are some good synonyms? Well, maybe private, anonymous comes close. Last one, protection from harm. Psychologists are obligated to protect their human subjects from harm. That protection from harm includes physical as well as psychological harm. So you should not be physically scarred or mentally scarred from being in a psychology experiment. So those are some of the most basic ethical guidelines that researchers are obligated to follow. So now let's consider the research methods used in lifespan development, or if you prefer developmental psychology. Many of these you probably covered in intro psychology. Maybe a few you didn't, and that's fine, but you should have a good underpinning, so this would be mostly refreshing what you know and adding on some good content as well, I hope. So let's go. Let's define the case study as an intensive investigation of a rare phenomenon. If you don't like the word phenomenon, right thing in a person. Many of psychology's most famous case studies are on the topic of multiple personality disorder. Can you think of any of these? Take a moment. Sybil is probably the most famous one. It was a movie with, after it was written, of course, it became a movie with Sally Field. She uh, was uh, Oscar nominated for it. Another thing, and I remember reading that as an undergraduate, I move on to another famous one after that, Three Faces of Eve. Uh, you can certainly guess how many personalities Eve had. Another famous one, When Rabbit Howls, I'll admit, a Rabbit, by the way, was one of the personalities. When Rabbit Howls, I didn't read that one. I had lost interest by that point. But again, these are examples of case studies on multiple personality disorder. But certainly, mul multiple personality disorder is not the only topic of case studies. Have you ever heard of Jeannie? As a young child, about age three, her father decided she was intellectually disabled and must go to the attic. I don't understand the logic either. She spent the next 10 years of her life in the attic. During the day, she was cha chained to a toilet. At night, they strapped her into their homemade straight jacket. She virtually never heard any language. She was barely fed. She was could not stand upright unsupported when they found her at age 13, had no language skills, and uh, was the size of a young, maybe five or six year old. Thank goodness this is not a standard way of rearing children, but if you want to find out what happens to children in this cruel and unusual circumstance, you better do a case study. You better get as much information as you possibly can because who knows when you'll see this again. Hopefully never. Have you ever heard of Phineas Gage? He was a Vermonter who was in a very unusual accident. We'll watch a little bit of a reenactment of his accident later in the course. Just to give you a little bit of details, a three foot, 13 pound metal rod was shot through one side of his skull and out the other. He survived, but worse for the wear. My last example of a case study would be described in a book of case studies called The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. It's a famous collection by a neurologist, very famous neurologist by the name of Oliver Sacks. In this particular case study, the man was a PhD, a musician, and he developed an unusual problem. Conversationally, he was perfectly normal, but when he looked at anything, he could not recognize it. But again, intellectually, he was fine. Eventually, he crossed paths with Dr. Sachs, and they had a long conversation about all sorts of subjects, and then they got down to business. Dr. Sachs uh, showed the gentleman several objects to identify. He could identify none of them. Then Dr. Sachs asked him to describe the objects. Let me give you one of the descriptions and see if you can figure out the object that our man who mistook his wife for a hat was trying to figure out. He looks at this common object and says, hmm, 
could be a container of some sort. Clearly, he's not clear on this. He says it has five out pouchings, and he adds, if out pouching is even a word. So can you think of things that always have five out pouchings? Common suggestions I get from my students are briefcases. Well, they don't have out pouches. Uh, pockets and pants, no, they're not out pouches. A hand? No, that doesn't have out pouches, but that's close. Ah, a glove. Five out pouches. He accidentally puts it on his hand and says, oh my god, it's a glove. So clearly he could see the object, but he could not interpret it. The issue was a very large tumor in the part of his brain that should have dealt with visual information, which unfortunately for him was on a permanent vacation. They concluded their interview and is leaving the office. Uh, Dr. Sachs walked him off to the office. The man went up to his wife and grabbed her head and tried to lift it. He thought her head was his hat. I loved his description, that is Dr. Sachs. By the looks of the woman's face, this was not the first time that this had happened. And so the book was titled, after this particular case study, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. So again, intensive investigations. So you want to get as much information as you possibly can. Maybe do an IQ test, a personality test, an MRI, interview them, interview people that know them, and so on because those are all ultra rare opportunities, so you need to get as much information as you possibly can, and that is the essence of a case study. Let's now consider the case study featured on this slide. The case of two conjoined twins, Tatiana and Krista. In the past, conjoined twins were called Siamese twins. Do you know why? Well, a very famous pair of conjoined twins were Asian gentlemen, and they were uh, featured by P.T. Barnum in one of his traveling shows, and they referred to as the Siamese twins, and so this became the term for all conjoined twins. As an interesting aside, nowadays this, those two gentlemen would have been easily separated. There's a band of fibrous tissue uh, joining them in their sides, but they couldn't risk it thinking that it might have had it. Uh, very important blood vessels. So they spent their entire life uh, conjoined. They married. Uh, they had children. The gentlemen go from house to house of the, each of the brothers. Uh, unusual arrangement, but it worked well for them. But let's get back to uh, Tatiana and Krista. Unlike the original twins that I mentioned, Tatiana and Krista cannot be separated because they share brain tissue. Interestingly, Part of the brain tissue they share would be the thalamus. Do you remember what the thalamus did from intro psych? Was it coordination? Did it connect the two sides of the brain? Maybe it was a sensory relay center? Indeed, it was a sensory relay center, meaning that since they share a thalamus, they can share some sensory experiences. So if one twin, for example, tastes something, the other twin can tell what is being tasted. Interesting, yes? So this is very unusual to have this degree of uh, conjoined uh, shared tissue in this particular manner. So researchers have gathered much information about Krista and Tatiana. And if you want to find more information, it is definitely available on the internet. Unfortunately, this short uh, trailer that I use has disappeared. Let's now consider observation as a research method. It's basically, just like it sounds, you're observing and of course you're carefully recording your data. It can be conducted in the laboratory or the real world, or we can tweak it a little bit. Let's consider the three basic types. Laboratory, done in the researcher's lab, such as uh, what's pictured in my little uh, clip or the picture attached. Field you're going out in the real world and observing. Participant, you actually join in with the group. For example, if you want to study the Amish, you get their permission and you uh, dress and live as the Amish live for a certain period of time. So three different choices, but uh, the laboratory and the field being much, much more common than the participant observation. Let's now turn our attention to the survey methods 
is a collection of methods which includes questionnaires, polls, interviews. It's particularly useful if our goal is to learn about opinions and beliefs. Survey methods are used quite a bit, though not necessarily in psychology, but in many disciplines. Even though they're used quite frequently, there are many problems associated with the survey methods. Let's, for example, say that I'm a sex researcher. I do teach human sexuality typically uh, every year. So let's say I choose to do a survey method and to learn about a particular subject or topic. What sort of problems might I come across in using the survey methods to learn about some aspect of human sexuality? Think for a moment and see if you can come up with some of the problems of this method. Let's consider content analysis. You probably didn't cover this in intro psych, or at least I don't teach it for my students. The basic type involves looking at media, such as commercials, lyrics, uh, Facebook posts. A sub-variety is called secondary content analysis, and that looks at data that's already been collected, so the work's done before you. So it could be hospital records if you're allowed access, police uh, reports, uh, newspapers, government records. This is often called, this form of research, archival research. Let's consider the correlational study. It's used when we want to be able to predict one variable from another. So it studies the relationship between variables. Its limitation is that even if there's a predictable relationship, we cannot cons we cannot assume, we cannot determine if there's causality, if there's causation. In other words, if there's a predictable relationship, is one causing the change observed in the other one? Maybe there is, maybe there isn't, but we can't tell from a correlational study. In Interpsych, I give the example of ice cream sales and death by drowning. There is a predictable relationship between the two. On the days that there are the most ice cream sales, there are the most deaths by drowning. On the days that there are the least deaths per drowning, there are the least ice cream sales. So there is a predictable relationship. But is one causing the other one? When somebody drowns, are there massive ice cream parties celebrating their death? Hopefully they weren't that kind of person. Or vice versa. No, there's a third variable involved, which is it explains the pattern. Think for a moment. Death by drowning in ice cream sales. What would be the variable that was related to each of them? Temperature. On days with high ice cream sales, uh, it's hotter. More people swim. On days with low ice cream sales, it's probably colder. Less people swim. So there's a Although there's a predictable relationship between the two, neither one is causing the other. The temperature is the causal factor, and that wasn't even considered in the correlation. So net end effect of our conclusion, yes, we can use it to predict, but we can't extend our prediction to say cause and effect or causality. Let's now consider a study called the correlational study. Its purpose, prediction. When we want to be able to predict one variable, from another. There are three types of correlations that might come out if we did correlation research. A positive correlation, a negative correlation, or a zero correlation. Some students incorrectly assume that positive means it's good, uh, negative means it's bad. Not at all. It just means that when you put your two sets of uh, numbers, your two sets of variables, into your statistical formula, it yields a positive number if it's a positive correlation. If you put all the numbers for each set of variables, each pair of set of variables more clearly, into your statistical formula, it would yield a negative number. And likewise, if you put your numbers into your statistical formula and solve, you get a zero. That means you have a zero correlation. In other words, no predictable relationship. The little graphic below shows you how, if you were graphing out your data, how it would fall if it was a positive correlation. It doesn't matter the particulars of the study. If that's a positive correlation, the numbers would have that uh, particular slant. Uh, 
if you have a negative correlation, no matter what variables you're studying, the data when graphed would have the appearance such as you see for the negative. And if you see no discernible pattern, uh, means you've got no correlation, or in other words, a zero correlation, which would be back to our original point, no ability to predict accurately. Let's now consider the experiment. We're really not supposed to have a favorite research method like people are not supposed to have a favorite child, but in this case, I think it's okay. This is our favorite research method because it is the only research method, note the caps, meaning it's highly important. It's the only research method which allows us to draw cause and effect conclusions, to say this thing causes the other to happen. In a correlational study, you can do prediction but you can't conclude that one variable is causing another. Let's consider an example. Let's say that I'm hired by a business to correlate two interesting variables, ice cream sales for every day in a year and deaths by drowning. And I find that there is a predictable correlation on days where there's lots of ice cream sales there tends to be more drowning. On days with very few ice cream sales, there tends to be less drowning. Are you willing to say that when people drown, people go out and have ice cream parties? Well, I hope not. If you eat ice cream, you're likely to flop around the floor and drown. Obviously not. So you can see that one can be predicted from the other, but what is causing the relationship? It's a third variable, if that's a hint. So on days with high ice cream sales, it's harder. When it's hotter, more people tend to swim, and not everybody swims as well as everybody else, so we have a higher rate of drowning. On cold days, people are less inclined to eat ice cream, and people are less inclined to swim, and therefore not risking drowning as great a frequency. So clearly, it's the temperature which is causing the relationship, not the variables directly influencing each other. So the point is that even if there's a predictable correlation, positive or negative, you cannot assume that the variables caused the change in the other one. Maybe they did. Maybe they didn't. The correlational study has no way of determining that information. If you want to do cause and effect, you better do an experiment. In an experiment, the researcher might choose to use a double blind or a single blind. A single blind means the participant, the human, the person, does not know if they're in the experimental group or control group. This is absolutely positively necessary. But an additional layer of precaution would be the double blind design in which neither the researcher nor the, ex the experimental subject know which group the experimental subject is in. That way the uh, researcher cannot unknowingly influence the outcome or the grading of behaviors, surveys, what have you. Now, practically, you wonder, well, how can this be done then? Well, your laboratory assistant uh, collects the data and then you analyze the data, not knowing who is in which group, or you use coding, subject A, B, C, D, D1, D2, D3, you get the idea, so that the researcher cannot unknowingly influence their interpretation of the data. And this is very standard and very necessary. Some students, primarily in introduction to psychology, are surprised to learn that we use deception in research. It's perfectly allowable as long as it's deemed necessary by the IRB. We'll talk more about this later on the ethics slide, though. So for now, know that yes, it is occasionally used. Experiments may or may not use animals. Perhaps you learn in psychology uh, the percentage that do use animals. Is it 1%, 10%, 90%, in between? Well, you might remember a little less than 10%. What is the most commonly used animal? Monkeys, dogs, all primates, rodents? It would be rodents. Almost all psychology experiments that use animals use rodents. Now, we said that overall, 
in psychology, if a little less than 10% of experiments use animals, that means 90 plus percent of experiments use people. In our particular course area, lifespan development, it's a much, much higher number of uh, experiments using people. So far less than the almost 10% across the general field of psychology. Before any research can be conducted, it must be approved by the IRB. Perhaps you know what these letters stand for. I often ask this question as a fill in the blank, and I receive a great wealth, great variety of answers. I, I get sometimes it's internal, sometimes international, sometimes institutional. The only one correct answer would be institutional. Each institution has its own IRB if there's research being conducted there. In days gone past, I was 50% of SCCC's IRB. R, I get many choices from research to review and other things as well. It would be review. And B, that would be board. So IRB is that particular institution's institutional review board. So the variables would be independent and dependent. The groups, experimental and control. Make sure you don't call it the experiment group and the control group. You're extremely likely to be marked wrong. In particular, it's problematic if you call it the controlled group. That's not a spelling error. That is a conceptual error. Calling something controlled sounds like it's being controlled, which is not the case. It gives control. It, it gives power. So again, the answer would be experimental and control group. Hopefully an introduction to psychology and or your other psychology or even sociology courses, you've learned the difference between the two variables and are comfortable with them now. But just in case you haven't, here's a little help, a mnemonic. The outcome in an experiment depends on everything that occurs, what group the individuals are in, if they get the treatment or not. So since the outcome is dependent on everything, the outcome that we measure is called the dependent variable. So in any experiment, there's a treatment that are, some are given and some are not. We want to see the outcome of this treatment given to some and some that were not. The outcome that we want to measure and learn about, the outcome, therefore, would be the dependent variable. Hopefully that helps if you needed it. Let's pause for a concept check to make sure you actually understand the variables and the groups. On tests, I'm not inclined to see if you can define a term that's easily uh, too easy to look up on the internet. I want to see if you actually know it, and how I determine if you know something is to give you applied example, like perhaps this one. So go ahead, take a moment, and identify the specific variables and groups in the study. Actually, do it. I will say that I often put a question like this in many of my first tests in the various courses I teach. Now, this will be the first time I've taught this course fully online, so we'll have to see if I want to include it. But I often do drop some very nice hints about some of the short answer questions that will appear on tests in the bonus folder in the short answer sample file. So do look at that as you prepare for the first test. But anyway, again, take a moment and see if you can answer the variables and groups. So first, you should be able to provide me the basic terms, independent and dependent variable, experimental, and control group. Now remember that the, we'll start with the dependent variable first. It's the outcome. It's the dependent thing. It's what we want to measure. So some people or animals are given a treatment or not, then we measure the outcome for all. So the dependent variable is the outcome. So in this particular experiment, it would be rodent activity levels. What are they dependent on? The treatment, uh, whether or not the animal got the drug. So the independent variable would be drug level or level of the drug. 
the groups, experimental and control, experimental group, give the particular drug. The control group treat alike in every way except they do not receive the specific drug. So if the uh, treatment is given in the form of injection, the experimental group will get injection of the active drug. The control group would be given a placebo injection. Hopefully you did well. If not, keep working at it. We just learned that there are three types of observational studies. Well, there are also three types of experiments. Uh, one, of course, is our traditional laboratory experiment, which most people think of when they think of an experiment. The other two would be field and natural or quasi. The field experiment is a true experiment just conducted in a natural setting. The natural or a quasi experiment takes advantage of a naturally occurring treatment, if we want to call it that, that's existing in the world. Go on to the next slide for a little bit more detail on this. Let's now consider the basic types of experiments. When we say the experiment, usually what we're referring to is the lab laboratory experiment, but just not saying so. There's also natural, or sometimes called naturalistic, and field. The laboratory experiment is the one we're used to, conducted in the researcher's laboratory. It's very convenient. Their office might be right outside the lab. Offers the most control, so extraneous variables aren't going to be able to sneak in and confound your results. But it might be less applicable to the real world. It's an artificial setting, artificial creation. Now there's also a natural or naturalistic experiment. It's conducted in the real world by taking advantage of some naturally occurring change. So not a traditional experiment. Uh, the variable being studied is the independent variable the treatment is not being introduced by the researcher. It's being created by real life. Offers no control. So there might be other factors creating the result, influencing the dependent variable that you're unaware of. But it is very applicable to the real world because it's happening in the real world. Our last possibility is the field experiment. It's between the two. Think of it as a regular experiment, but it's conducted in the real world. So the researchers are going to the real world settings. They are themselves introducing the independent variable. So it's not the like the naturalistic where the variables introduced by reality, the world constraints. The researcher is doing the work here. It's middle in terms of control, less than lab the laboratory or laboratory. Uh, more than naturalistic. And since it's occurring in the real world, it's also very applicable to the real world, which the laboratory experiment may or may not be. Momentarily, I'll give you an example, so it might help you uh, get a firm uh, understanding of these three types of experiments. Let's say the researcher wants to learn the effects of maybe first time access to internet exposure to the internet. And you might say, where could that be? Well, there's still lots of areas, rural areas of the US in which internet is not available. Not so much in the our area in the capital district, but even certain parts of New York State. So they want to see the effects of internet access in terms of whatever variable they're looking at, whether family dynamics, communication, attention span, whatever. So in the laboratory experiment, maybe the researchers uh, allow internet access for free as long as it's access to the laboratory. Part of uh, maybe the, their college or university, uh, they go to certain areas and they will have free access to internet. So definitely in the laboratory setting, especially if it's actually in the laboratory building in the actual laboratory area. Naturalistic, uh, 
maybe there's an area for the first time that internet is being introduced by the Spectrum or Time Warner, what have you. So the researcher isn't doing it, but the it's naturally occurring in the environment. They'll still be measuring, measuring the same dependent variable, but the researcher is not introducing it. In the field experiment, the researcher would be uh, introducing the treatment, the access to internet. So maybe as part of the uh, study, researchers have uh, applied for a large grant and will provide a certain, say, town uh, or even part of a city free internet. So the researchers are actually introducing the treatment into the real world. So you can see laboratory is actually creating the laboratory, naturalistic, totally not controlled by the researcher or whatever. And the field experiment, the researcher is taking their experiment on the road, taking it to the real world. I very commonly hear my students use the phrase that the study proved something. We don't use such terms in psychology. We might say the study or experiment provided evidence for a particular hypothesis, but not prove. One study alone uh, is a good start, but that's it. After that one good study is published, other scientists will try to redo it to see if they get the same results. Because occasionally things that happen are just flukes. They'll never happen again. Others, the outcome is due to the treatment. So they've got to redo it to make sure it was due to the treatment that is the outcome rather than just a fluke, a one-time occurrence. So we use the term replication. Scientists will try to replicate the results and replication is a process in which we redo that experiment to see if the same results occur. And replication is not just limited to psychology, it's done in all the sciences. Two methods specific to developmental psychology are the twin and the adoption study. We'd use them if we wanted to investigate the nature versus nurture theme. Well, another set of research methods that are also used extensively in developmental psychology would be two methods that study age-related change. In other words, how we change across the lifespan. You can see that they're the longitudinal and cross-sectional study. In the longitudinal study, you see the word long, and that will help you. You follow the same group of people for a long, a extended period of time. So for example, maybe we want to follow a group of people from age two to age eight. That study would obviously take us six years. Good longitudinal studies may last a decade or more. When they come out, they generate a lot of sensation in the academic community, and they're cited quite extensively. They're quite important but they are quite difficult and expensive to conduct. Another alternative, uh, which is not quite as strong, but still very useful, is the cross-sectional study. In a cross-sectional study, we'll get a group of subjects of different ages and study them at the same time. So maybe the researchers, in a matter of a week or two or three, might investigate their topics of interest in a group of two-year-olds six-year-olds and eight-year-olds. So instead of waiting six years, they can gather that data in weeks because they're viewing people of all those ages at the same time. The big problem with the cross-sectional study is that we're not sure that the differences between the younger individuals and the older individuals are due to aging. Maybe they're due to something cultural that's going on. For example, maybe the internet was introduced uh, maybe social change occurred. Maybe they grew up in a particular uh, time in history. So although we want to conclude the differences in the cohorts were due to aging, we're not positive. And that's its downfall. Let's now consider another family of studies. Genetic studies. We use these when we're trying to determine the relative contribution of nature and nurture, in other words, genetics versus environment, for a particular trait. We have three main study types from which to choose. 
family, sometimes called kinship, adoption, and twin studies. Let's consider the family or kinship study first. It's a good starting off point. We have a particular thing we're interested in as a researcher, maybe it's intelligence or alcoholism or schizophrenia, or giftedness, what have you. And we want to see if there's a genetic component to this trait. Well, we go out there and try to find families in which that trait runs in generation after generation after generation. If, none, if no such studies can be found, we can assume it's probably not genetically uh, influenced. But what if we do find studies in which this trait runs in many generations. Can we now conclude that genes have a significant or even somewhat of a role? No. For example, you probably know a family in which many of the members have been Democrats for generation after generation, or maybe Republicans generation after generation. Because that trait is multi-generational, can you now conclude that there's a gene for Republicanism or uh, being a Democrat? Certainly not. But it's a good starting off point. Of all the study types, it's the easiest to do, but it also provides the least satisfying information. Basically, all we can conclude if we do find such families is that it could be genetically influenced. I don't think you would find could be to be very satisfying if you ask a teacher, am I passing? Well, you could be. Will it be a test today? Well, there could be. Not satisfying. So again, you get into it what you, you get out of it what you put into it, which is basically very little. But again, it's an easy starting off point. And if we believe that there is a reason to go on, then we'll probably do the adoption or twin study next. So we have a particular trait we're interested in: schizophrenia, dyslexia, giftedness, autism spectrum, what have you. And we'll go to an adoption registry. In the U.S. they tend to be private and restricted. We'll probably pay the use of Scandinavian adoption registry. So we'll look at that uh, individuals who all have that trait. Uh, otherwise we'll be way start time, let's say uh, schizophrenia. So we'll look at children that only have developed schizophrenia and we'll look at the records for their adoptive parents and their rearing parents to see uh, if they have schizophrenia or not. And that can tell us if it's nature or nurture. So let me ask you, let's say that you tend to find a schizophrenia at much, much higher rate in their biological parents than their adoptive parents. What would you conclude? Or the reverse, let's say that you find schizophrenia much more in the adoptive parents, but not in the biological parents. What would you conclude? Well, if it was much more prevalent and their biological parents, we would include nature, genetics. If it's much more common in their uh, rearing parents, we would say nurture. And if you're curious of what you would find, it would be uh, much higher in the biological parents of these individuals and no higher rate than the general population in the adoptive parents. So the logic of this study is very clear, I think. Which does the child resemble most? The, I'm sorry, which type of uh, individual does the child resemble most, the adoptive parent or the rearing parent? So you get a very clean and easy to understand nature versus nurture outcome. So let's start by discussing the two basic types of twins. What would they be? Well, think for a moment. I think you probably know. Fraternal and identical, fair enough. Unless you're in the biology program, you might want to be fancy and say monozygotic or dizygotic, but identical and fraternal are fine. Next question, how are they formed? So think of your answer for each one of the two twin types, starting with sperm cells and egg cells. You might think, oh, this is so simple, but every year I get answers that cannot possibly exist in the real world as we know it. So for the identical twin, uh, one egg cell is released is fertilized by one sperm cell and at some point it cleaves into hopefully two clean pieces or three clean separated pieces. If it's not a clean and full separation then we get to the conjoined twin situation. For the fraternal twin mom would release two or more eggs 
and each egg would be fertilized by a different sperm. Now a harder question, what is the genetic relatedness of identical twin to identical twin and what's the genetic relatedness of fraternal twin to fraternal twin? That'd be a percentage we're looking for. And can they be of differing sexes or do they have to be of the same sex? So again, for each twin type, what percentage of genetics in common and can they be of the quote unquote opposite sexes? We'll learn later in the course why that's not a good term. So starting with identical twins, they're identical, so they share 100% of the genes in common. Can they be of different sexes? Well, that would be kind of different, right? If one was male with all the male parts and female with all the female parts. So no, they cannot be of the quote unquote different sexes. Fraternal twins, they have as much genetics in common as the average set of uh, siblings. So on average, on average, mind you, 50%. Can they be of differing sexes? Absolutely. Next, let's tackle the concept of concordance. Concordance means that when you consider a given pair of twins, do they match in the characteristic being studied? So example, if you're studying schizophrenia, if one twin has schizophrenia, does the other. If you're studying autism spectrum, if one twin is on the spectrum, does the other. So we're very interested in concordance. Lastly, the, we'll use this concordance rate to calculate the relative contributions of genetics and environment. This is fairly complicated. In fact, I was surprised in graduate school to learn that many of the first uh, geneticists had to be by necessity statisticians. Many statistical techniques were developed by the geneticists to answer their questions such as this. So we won't get into the logic of it, but basically each twin is raised in the same environment as the other twin, otherwise they can't be in the study. So the environment's the same, but the degree of genetic relatedness varies from twin type to twin type. And that's how we'll come to our decision of which is the relative more important on nature or nurture for our trait. It gets a little complicated. Don't be afraid to listen to the uh, particular narration again. So for each concept check, use it to test your studying. I'll wait to answer until after you've studied the chapter a bit. Our major tests will be timed and will not allow you enough time to look up the answers. You'll, and often you'll see applied questions. So again, don't plan on just looking up the answers, plan on learning this information as you go along. So go ahead, study and see how you do on these and check your answer. So the three domains, one was physical, one was cognitive, though I would certainly accept intellectual. Third one, was it political, social? Hopefully not. You either call it emotional, social, or easier to say, socio-emotional or psychosocial. Next one in terms of the steps of the scientific method, if we're going to do a four-step uh, perspective, first one would be to create a hypothesis, formulate a hypothesis, state a hypothesis. Then you could say test your hypothesis or you could say collect data. Can you put do an experiment? No, because that leaves off so many research methods. So your answer would have to include all of them. So conduct a study, collect data, or some other answer that would include all the methods. Next, publish. I get a lot of times I hear publish, but publish what? You have no results. Ah, so perform a statistical analysis to get the results. Uh, get your results and draw a conclusion, but you'd have to analyze your data or get your results. And all the students up there, sadly, if that's a hobby at that point, it's not the scientific method. You've got to publish, try to publish, share what you learned, any phrasing to that effect. I'm always shocked in intro psych when students get the test, they can't name the basic variables or groups. It also shocks me even more that when they do poorly on one test, instead of studying the concepts, they go to the next test 
and get a similar question wrong again. So our tests will always look at the one previous test. So you will not do good, do well, I'm sorry, do well on a test unless you study and learn the concepts that gave you trouble on the previous test. But anyway, go ahead and uh, give this very important question uh, your best. And again, refer to your notes if you have to, but eventually make sure you can do it on your own because this may well be a short answer multiple point question on test one. So let's consider three potential hypotheses. First one, is there a relationship between alcohol consumption by pregnant rats and the activity levels of their offspring? Eh, terrible. It's a question, not a prediction. So the next one, alcohol consumption by pregnant rats will influence the activity levels of the pups. Certainly better, but also still a loser because it's vague. Is it going to increase the activity levels or decrease them? They're opposite. We need to know. We need to be specific. Consider the next one. Pregnant rats who consume alcohol will have offspring that are more active than rats that don't. Now that's a good hypothesis. For the next part, identify the variables and groups, the terminology, and then specifically what they would be. So for number two, independent and dependent variable. Let's start with the dependent variable first. The dependent variable is called dependent because it's the outcome. The outcome depends on everything that goes on. So the thing that we want to measure, the thing that's dependent, would be the rat pup's activity levels. The treatment, in other words, the independent variable, you could say level of alcohol, uh, alcohol consumption. Don't put alcohol because alcohol is something we drink. Alcohol consumption, level of alcohol given. Uh, part three, the groups, well, experimental and control. Make sure you don't put experiment and controlled. It is experimental and control group. The experimental group, those rats given alcohol, or you can say those rat pups given alcohol prenatally, that's fine too. The other group, the control group, the rats not given alcohol, or the pups not given alcohol prenatally. Hopefully that was uh, easy for you. If not, try it again, and maybe even do another practice. Starting with the methods that distinguish nature from nurture. Well, we have the first one, known as kinship or family. We also have twin and adoptee or adoption methods that are used to change uh, study change over time or change cross aging that would be the longitudinal and the cross-sectional which your textbook prefers to call sequential by the way three types of observational studies the not so at all common participant as well as laboratory or field, three types of experiments. We also have the laboratory or lab, in other words, field, and the other choice, unnaturalistic. You've probably noticed that this review slide has content from our previous chapter, and this is done intentionally. It's much easier to learn concepts and reinforce them as you go along than say them to massively study before a test. I found as a student, as an undergraduate myself, that before you begin studying a new day's notes, if you review the previous notes, by the time the test rolls around, you'll know just about everything. And also, you'll do better course on a final as cumulative such as ours, and you'll also retain information for your field of work or your next course that might expect that you have certain uh, baseline knowledge. So just a hint, but uh, consider it anyway.